that you're all joining us on the, the Astro Imaging channel on YouTube. But I want to call your attention to what's coming up over the next uh, over the next little while. Joe's here today. Ray's here tonight with us. He was practicing his presentation a little bit. And he's going to be telling us about how he took some images of Mars during the Mars opposition of 2020 and the kinds of things he learned. Remember when Andy Campbell got cut off by the fact that the um, – uh, internet broke for Molly about four or five weeks ago. Well, he's coming back to finish sharing some of those images and things like that. Will Young about night vision imaging the week after that. And Jonathan Talbot is coming up in early December to tell us about the ZWO ASI 6200 MM Pro and uh, how you move from CCD or how he moved anyway, because everybody does it a little different from CCD to CMOS. Tom Glenn took an amazing picture of Mars and the ISS, and I saw it and I said, oh, I got to get him because, you know, he, that's that's really quite a trick, getting a picture of the ISS as it's passing by. So um, he's got a picture he's going to tell us about. So we've got an open day, and I hope that one of you guys can hit that contact button up here at the top of the screen and say what your first and last name is, your email, and your comment. And your comment should be, hey, I've done some work on so-and-so and I'd like to present it. Because the Astro Imaging Channel gets its strength from the people who are part of the Astro Imaging Channel. All of you, 40, 50, 60 people that watch every Sunday and five or 600 that watch in the course of the next week or so, um, we need you here, okay? We need you here to um, make presentations. Um, so please do that. Now there's another reason you need to hit the contact button and contact us because we are going to have another imaging channel. Uh, do you remember a long time ago, back when the comet was by, we asked you to submit um, uh, images to our Facebook group page and uh, to this uh, page here on uh, the astroimagingchannel.org. And um, we put them all together in a a pretty nice little video of all the, all the comet neowises that came by. Well, we're doing the same thing. We're going to ask you all to take a picture of something in Orion or Orion or all of Orion or a little bit of Orion or M42 or M, what is it, 78 up there or the horsey or something in Orion. It's your choice or the whole constellation Orion if you like. But it's got to be taken this year. Now, this apparition, this this time where it came over. You can't reach back into last year's work or the year before or five years ago and your favorite Orion picture you ever took. You got It's got to be one you're taking this year. So it'll be your little challenge to take a picture of something in Orion uh, or Orion and uh, send it up to our Facebook group page or uh, you can send us a link to it here and we'll figure out how to get how to get a copy of it and things like that. Now, you've got between now and Super Bowl Sunday, which for those of you who aren't in America, uh, it's February 7th, okay? So uh, February 7th is the last date we're going to be taking these pictures in, and we'll put them together then. So you've got, what, two, three months here to make your best picture of something in Orion and submit it to either our Facebook page or to this contact page here at the Astro Imaging Channel. We'll tell you more about it in upcoming weeks, but, you know, get your cameras out or whatever you do with these camera things and uh, take a picture of something in Orion and uh, send it in to us and we'll start collecting them and we'll make a movie out of it eventually. And maybe we'll even have a show bringing a few of the people that, that contributed something and they can tell us why they chose, why they did and stuff like that. Anyway, announcing our Orion Challenge or our Orion Workshop or something like that. We haven't thought of a title for it yet. Um, we don't plan things that thoroughly, you know. Okay, uh, I think I'm going to stop sharing. Stop sharing and um, stop sharing. Oh, I got to get back over here. Um, tonight we've got Joe coming to us. He's coming to us from the um, space telescope science institute uh the people who do hubble and i'm going to let him tell you about the rest of that joe you ready to go 
I'm all set. I think I just have to hit. Okay, start your presenting. All right. Okay, is everyone seeing my screen now? Yeah, just a second, Joe, while I, you keep, keep, keep presenting as you are. Don't forget, people, you can go on over to the um, uh, YouTube comment section and ask questions of Joe about how he does it and, you know, how you can get a job working with them. And, and oh, anyway, just go ahead. Take it, Joe. Sure. Well, thanks for that introduction, Alex, and, and thanks for having me on tonight. Um, as Alex said, I work at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, I've been there for about three years. Before that, I was with the Chandra X-ray Observatory up at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, I was there for 16 years as a, a data scientist. I worked on the, uh, the ACES instrument of Chandra for eight years. And then I worked in public outreach, uh, making images of space in X-ray light for, uh, for the next eight years until I moved into Space Telescope about tonight is I want to give you a little bit of uh, history, a little bit of background on Hubble and its story, because it's a really compelling, amazing story. And then, of course, the amazing imagery of Hubble. We'll, we'll dig into that a little bit, and we'll look at uh, a couple examples of how these images are put together. Um, <clears throat> the title of my talk is Translating Cosmic Light, Hubble's Perspective of the Universe. Um, I like to think of the work that we do in, in converting the data from Hubble into imagery for press releases as translation. Um, you know, a lot of times the, the filters that are used are considered, the, the images that come out of that are considered false color. And that just sort of has this connotation to it that the images are somehow fake or just not real. Um, but that couldn't be further from the truth. These are real data. This is, you know, optical light coming down from space into Hubble's electronics and is being converted into data that we then take and interpret and apply color to and create these, you know, beautiful vistas of the universe. So let's jump in. Hubble is 30 years old as of this year. It's been around for a long time. There's an you know, entire generation of people whose understanding of the universe and what it looks like is, has been shaped by Hubble. Equally so, there's an entire generation of scientists who have been working with Hubble data their, their entire careers, which is kind of amazing. Um, it's probably one of the most productive scientific endeavors in history. There's something like 950 papers per year that come out from Hubble. Uh, 800,000 plus citations, 600 PhD theses, comes out to like one per week, two papers a day. One in six astronomy papers includes Hubble data. A little factoid about Hubble, it has a focal length of 57,600 millimeters at an F24 aperture. <laughs> I always like to throw that in. It wasn't always this rosy with Hubble, though. I'm sure many of you on, this, uh, on, the, on the Astro Imaging channel probably remember when Hubble was launched, it had a, a flaw, a pretty major flaw in the design of the, the mirror. Um, but just as there's an entire generation of people who've only known Hubble as you know a window into the universe, they also may not realize that Hubble went through some pretty, you know, it went through a pretty beginning years of its, uh, its lifetime in space. So it was launched in 1990 and it was quickly discovered soon after that there was actually a spherical aberration on the main mirror of the telescope. And I'll get into that in a second. You know, it made a lot of news. It was it was considered a pretty big deal. <laughs> you know, it was $3 billion, this telescope that was supposed to give us a completely new view of the universe. Turns out that it doesn't really work right. It made all the news. Newsweek here, star-crossed, $1.5 billion blunder. Hubble telescope loses large part of its optical ability. Crippled by a flaw in a mirror. And it turns out that flaw was actually in partly due to uh, the design of the mirror. The, the fabrication um, at per Perkin Elmer Corporation actually built the mirror. And while they were grinding the mirror down, the instruments were actually miscalibrated. And um, my understanding is that the miscalibration was due to not calibrating the effects of gravity, causing a slight sag in the mirror as it was being built, not present in space when it's you know up in space. Uh, this aberration came out to be about one fiftieth the thickness of a human hair. So we're talking about something extremely small, extremely sensitive, but it made all the difference in the world. And for those of you who don't know, a spherical aberration is has to do directly with the shape of the mirror. You know, in a perfect optical system, you have a mirror that um, focuses to a single point, and that is the focal length of the telescope. A misalignment in the mirror shape, 
you end up getting multiple focal points throughout this range of focal points. And none of them really is um, a, a true focus in that system. And so what you end up getting is blurred images where stars end up looking like this. Uh, this strange shape around that star is this sort of confusion caused by the spherical aberration blurring out the image. Now, what's interesting is that Hubble, even with this spherical aberration, was still an amazing instrument. I mean, this is the same star imaged from the ground on the left and with Hubble with its spherical aberration on the right. So it was still a major improvement over ground-based ob observations. But as you know, people in the news and, and, and pop culture realized, it, it could have been a lot better. <clears throat> As you can see the first photos from Hubble, the taxpayers look pretty angry. <laughs> it even made its way into pop culture. There was a time where to Hubble was considered to make an outrageously stupid mistake at an exorbitant cost. For anyone who remembers this movie, The Naked Gun, two and a half, there was actually a scene where Frank Drebin is really, really sad. And he goes to this, this club, uh, the Blue Note Cafe. And in the club, there's like pictures of history's greatest blunders all over the place. And one corner there is a picture of Hubble. So it really, it really was a big deal at the time. Thankfully, the NASA had designed Hubble to be repaired in orbit uh, through the space shuttle program. And the servicing mission one occurred in uh, December of 1993, where uh, astronauts actually installed the, the WIFPIC-2 camera. They replaced WIFPIC-1 with WIFPIC-2. And they also installed the CoStar mechanism, which was sort of the corrective lenses for uh, for Hubble. And uh, with, with PIC-2 actually itself um, repaired the flaw in the mirror. It was designed to account for that. And then CoStar was put in place to fix that flaw for the other instruments that were still there. Um, but as it turns out, before the servicing mission happened, uh, there was some software developed at Space Telescope to enhance the blurry images and, and try to calibrate out some of that sphere collaborations effects. And this actually led to downstream development of useful imaging processing tools. And uh, for those of you who don't know, COSTAR actually is an acronym for Corrective Optics Space Telescope Axial Replacement. Now, after installing uh, WIFPIC-2, you can see now that the image on the right, it, that's what Hubble should have been doing from the beginning. It's a huge deal once this finally happened um, and we replaced <clears throat> we fixed the uh, sphere collaboration. This is actually uh, Senator Barbara Mikulski, um, the, the Maryland Senator, showing the uh, Hubble's new image of the core of M100 right after the servicing mission. Um, and she described it as being like, finally seeing, you know, finally putting on my glasses and looking at something and seeing it clear for the first time. Now, two years ago, we actually went back and um, for the 25th anniversary of servicing mission one, we looked at M100 again. And we compared, we put together, I put together this image that shows that same uh, image of the core of M100 left uh, before the servicing mission. And then with PIC2 in 1994, after the servicing mission. And then again with uh, Wifield Camera 3, which was installed in the final servicing mission in 2009. Uh, and that picture, that image was taken in 2018. And then just to give you some perspective on M100, the galaxy, we, we also have the wide field image as well. And this compares the original with pick one data with a sphere collaboration to the WIFC3 data in 2018 on the left and the right, respectively. So this is kind of a just a triumphant story of Hubble overcoming adversity. Uh, it was it was heroic, really. It's kind of a, a story that could only be made in Hollywood. You know, you've got this overcoming adversity, dealing with major issues, and then coming out on the other side victorious and and really. Uh, starting beginning to change people's understanding of the universe. And so the tide started to change. Pop culture realized that Hubble was fixed and we, we really did have a new view of the universe. Sold this, um, what really helped people realize just how great Hubble was after this uh, <clears throat> servicing mission was in 1994, in July of 1994, and I'm sure many of you remember this, uh, Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 impacted um, in the atmosphere of Jupiter. And this was one of the first major observations that Hubble did after the servicing mission. Directed optics, it created these amazing images of a comet impacting on Jupiter. And we could see the scars of this impact. Now, this wouldn't have been possible without the uh, servicing mission. So it was just, you know, an icing on the cake of that, that whole story 
of Hubble overcoming its its flaw. 2009, uh, that was the final servicing mission. So Hubble is actually at the point now where it's it's been in orbit longer. It, this is the longest it's gone without a servicing mission, and it's still operating at peak performance, uh, which is great. <clears throat> so let's take a little bit of a look into what, what Hubble looks like on the inside, what it's made of. Too far into the weeds here, I just wanted to, to show you a couple of um, detail shots of, of the Wide Field Camera 3 instrument, since a lot of our images come from that. Just an overall view of the insides here. You know, there's the light path. The universe comes in, bounces off the primary mirror, hits the secondary mirror, goes down through the baffle, and that's where the equipment bays, the instruments are. Um, so this is, you know, sort of the, the very simplistic overview of how Hubble works. And now, your attention, I want to draw your attention to that FGS uh, WIFC-3. That's the fine, gu fine guidance sensor and the Widefield Camera 3. So Widefield Camera 3 actually just plugs right in there. And this is what that looks like. At the very bottom of this image, there's a, a thing called a pickoff mirror. That is literally where the instrument takes the light coming in from the secondary mirror. I should probably defer that. <laughs> a message on my computer uh yes we can okay i'm gonna drop out of my presentation for a second so i can see my mouse okay and i will defer that because it would make me reboot <laughs> i'll tell you what joe take uh, yeah. are you are you ready to go now or do you need to do more no i'm ready to go okay keep going okay thanks Okay, so here we're looking at a, a very detailed view of Widefield Camera 3, and I, I just wanted to show you, you know, these instruments are incredibly complex. Detailed, the engineering that's gone into this is just amazing. It's incredible that these things, you know, that the astronauts literally plug this in. I mean, it's a little more complicated than plugging it in, but they installed it into the telescope, turn it on, and, you know, for the last 11 years, we've been getting incredible data from these instruments. So it's really a testament to, you know, the, the thousands of people who've been working on this program over its 30 years that Hubble has been the success that it is. Let's take a, a closer look at uh, WIFC-3. Here on the right, we actually see the CCD detector, <clears throat> uh, 2K by 4K detector. There's two of them, so it's actually a 4K by 4K CCD. It has a four hundredth of an arc second per pixel resolution, a field of view of 162 by 162 arc seconds. And then on the left there is the, the filter wheels for WIFC-3. Uh, WIFC-3 actually has filters that go from ultraviolet all the way to near infrared. Uh, there's 48 total, total filter slots. Includes wide band, medium band, and narrow band filters. And those are literally you know, filter wheels. There's physical mechanisms that rotate the, the filters into place depending on what the observation calls for. All right, so at this point, I'm going to jump out of this little you know, history lesson on Hubble and start to talk a little bit more about what I do for Hubble scope and, and why we do it. So I'm a senior science visuals developer for Hubble. And what that means is I, I work with the data from Hubble. I work with the scientists who take the data, the imagery that we use for our press releases that help to illustrate uh, the science results that these scientists are working with. Um, you know, a big part of that is visualizing the data. And five of that is to engage our audience and, and educate people. So uh, my, my, the office that I work for is the Office of Public Outreach. Our whole goal is to help spread the word about what Hubble does, what the scientists who work with Hubble are doing, and the, the amazing um, advances that they're making in, in our understanding of the universe. And <clears throat> the thing that's, that I really love about this job is that it, it truly is a balance between aesthetics and science. It's, uh, you know, our, our, our goal is to engage people. And so we, we take the data from Hubble, which by its very nature is just incredible. When Hubble takes an image, it's just a beautiful thing. Even in black and white, when I see the raw data on my, my screen, I'm looking at it and I'm seeing just this, this beautiful image of space. And I know that it's going to, you know, once we apply some color to it, it's going to just be another uh, classic Hubble image, um, <clears throat> but it's driven by the science. It's so there, you know, we're not making things up and we're not 
putting things in the image that shouldn't be there or weren't there to begin with. This is really starting from the data to create a, a beautiful image that helps tell the science story. So let's take a little walk through uh, some of Hubble's famous images from starting in our solar system and moving outwards. Uh, this is some Hubble imagery of, of planets. So, you know, I'd like to set the stage here for what I've been working on since I've been with Hubble. Um, we, you know, we can really appreciate that not only is Hubble an exquisitely sensitive science instrument, but it's also producing these beautiful landscapes of the universe and really taps into sort of a, a primordial urge for people to understand their place in the universe. Here we are understanding our, our place in our solar system with Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. We move out further. This is you know, the infamous Pillars of Creation image. This was the one that was done uh, in 2009 after WIFC 3 was installed, revisiting the Pillars of Creation that were observed with uh, with PIC 2. I mean, these are just stunning images in their own right and also filled with science content. The Horsehead Nebula. And this actually combines optical and near infrared light, again taken with WIFC3. Here's a view of the core of the Lagoon Nebula, Messier 8. This was taken in 2018 for the uh, of Hubble, Hubble's launch. The Bubble Nebula, another just incredible vista in space. Shift gears and 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 go out beyond the Milky. Milky Way, just beyond the Milky Way. <laughs> this was NGC 2020. This was our 30th anniversary image that we just put out this year. The Large Magellanic Cloud. Now looking out even further, the Sombrero Galaxy. You know, in addition to the deep scientific results that Hubble, Hubble just gives us this beautiful view of the universe. The, the, the further we look, the deeper we look, it's, it's always some some further insight into our, our place in the universe. Here's uh, galaxy cluster Abel 370. Uh, what I love about this one is the, uh, the dragon galaxy, we call it at the, the bottom there on the left side. That's, uh, you know, this, there's a the foreground galaxy, Abel 370 here, that is actually bending the light of background galaxies around it and causing these gravitational arcs, these gravitational lenses. So all of these sort of lines that you're seeing through the image here are background galaxies where the light has been bent around the foreground galaxies as it's making its way to Earth or to Hubble's instruments. It's just incredible. The one on the bottom left there is just, you know, that's one galaxy sort of smeared out, and you can see how it sort of rides around the, the little elliptical galaxies near it. Get the, uh, the ultra deep field image where Hubble stared at a mostly blank patch of sky. Now, this is the ultra deep field, which was released in uh, 2014. 13 filters of data spanning ultraviolet to near infrared light. It's over 600 hours of observing time, over about a, a decade's worth of observations. And what's incredible about this is, again, you know, this was thought to be a pretty blank patch of sky, a very small patch of sky, in fact. Um, but looking at it for that long and that deep with Hubble, reveals just this sea of galaxies. I think there's two or three foreground Milky Way stars in this image. Everything else, every single point of light in this image is another galaxy, another distant galaxy. And if you haven't had a chance to see this, I highly recommend checking out deepfieldfilm.com. I don't have time to get into all of that here right now, but it was a collaboration between Space Telescope Science Institute and a composer. Um, Eric Whitaker, who put together a, a, a great piece of music that was inspired by the Hubble Deep Field image. Um, so you can see that film here at deepfieldfilm.com. So now I'd like to take a, a few minutes to talk about the process, how we get to these beautiful images. As we go, how much this is starting from the data and making its way into beautiful imagery. Um, and you know this this shows a good example of that at the top row there. I'm just demonstrating here that these images come from raw data. This is actually taken with the uh, advanced camera for surveys of NGC 5189. And at the top, you're seeing you know the the data in its most raw state. 
you're seeing, um, you know, biases that haven't been accounted for. Uh, it's really small here, but there would be, it would be littered with cosmic rays. Uh, the way these observations work is that we would take data in one filter at a time. So in this case, we have red, green, and blue. Uh, this was broadband filters, I believe, for this image. Um, <clears throat> and so we take the longest wavelength image here would, would be the red filter. And that's made up of a series of observations that are then combined together, calibrate those differences out. You know, this is sort of the pre-processing step to, to come to a, a final flat image that we then apply a color to. So, you know, in the one on the left, it's the red, it's on the right blue. And then those are combined together to create the full color image. And that's sort of moving into the post-processing stage. Um, you know, that, that's where this process goes from being more, uh, you know, data-driven scientific into more aesthetically driven, where I get to, you know, exercise my photographer skills, uh, thinking about the images in terms of tonality and color and composition. Now, the tonality is important, and that's really driven by the scaling of the image. And, you know, I, I know I'm speaking to the Astro Imaging channel, so you guys are very familiar with this stuff. I can probably jump through this pretty quickly. But this is uh, this can be a very subjective step in the process of creating an image. How do you scale it? Because the the amount of information that's present in that the, the the CCD is sensitive to a far greater range of light than our eyes are, but it's compressed in its raw state. And so you're seeing, you know, in a linear image, you're seeing mostly the highlights, the bright cores of stars, the bright cores of galaxies, but a lot of the detail information is being lost. And so you have to scale that image somehow. Now you can scale it linearly and just make it brighter. The bright stuff gets even brighter and you lose information in the bright stuff. So those cores of the stars and the cores of the galaxies just get saturated to white. So ideally you want to do some kind of scaling that preserves the information in the cores of the bright regions, but also allows you to see the details in the, the shaded regions, the darker regions of the image. And so in this case of Stefan's Quintet, here's a nonlinear scaling of this image. Um, this is using an uh, a sign uh, scale factor. And one of the ways we can do that, this is a, a free tool called Fitz Liberator. If you're interested, the link at the bottom here, if you want to try this out yourself. Um, and it just so happens that there, a new version of Fitz Liberator is currently in development. So uh, you know, keep an eye out for that if you're interested. But Fitz Liberator basically allows you to do that kind of scaling to an image. And so um, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about, at the end of this talk about how if you want to try playing around with Hubble data, where you can go to do that. And if you want to scale the image, this is one way you can do that. The Fitz Liberator allows you to take that data, it's called a Fitz file for flexible image transport system. And it allows you to you know, take that data in, scale it however you want to, so that you can see the details in the data and then save it out as a, a TIFF image and then work with it somewhere else in some other software. And I probably should say at this point that if I mention specific software, uh, it's not an endorsement of that software. I don't, I, I'm not endorsing anything. I'm just talking about my process. Um, I do use PixInsight quite a bit. Again, not an endorsement. <laughs> uh, PixInsight, I find to be really useful for the initial scaling of images and for the color combinations. Um, I know there, you know, there are wars <laughs> among astrophotographers about PixInsight and Photoshop and Deep Sky Stacker and Maxim and all that stuff. I, I, I see it all as tools. And I work with the tools that I know, and I try to learn as much as I can about other tools. And if I see a use for something, I mean, my workflow, typically, I will start with PixInsight and move into other image processing software as I work uh, to finish the image off. So I, you know, again, I see it all as tools to help me get to my ultimate goal of creating um, a beautiful composite color image. And so this is the process, right? Composite color creating a really clean black and white image in each of the bands that you have, and then applying color to it and bringing it all together. Of course, the data is black and white when it starts, but we apply color. So just stepping through a, a few examples of that, uh, again, with Stefan's Quintet, this was uh, broadband filters in uh, B, V, and I. So that you know roughly translates to blue, green, and red light. So we assign blue, green, and red and pull it together to make the color image. And then, you know, this is what you get when you just start 
from the raw data, uh, create a, a clean image, and then make your, your color composite. Now you could you know call it a day, say that's my image, beautiful. But there's still more you can do with this, of course. There's a <clears throat> there's a sort of green color cast to this image that you know I would want to clean up. Um, I I know that the colors of uh, that spiral galaxy could use some work. You know you want to be able to see the H2 regions really shining in, in red in this image. And so you know there's that post production work, this moving from the science into the aesthetics, uh, really getting that color balance right. And really getting the image to pop and make it something that that draws people attention, people's attention in, and and wants them to learn, you know, inspire them to learn more about science. So how about narrowband filters? You probably are familiar with the Hubble palette. This is where that comes into play. Uh, <clears throat> these are narrowband filters, the SHO, uh, sulfur, hydrogen alpha, and oxygen. And you know, if we were to color these images according to where these elements emit on the visible spectrum, well, sulfur and hydrogen emit mostly in the red region of the spectrum, and oxygen emits in uh, around cyan. And so if you were to color it that way, you would get an image that looks like this. That's a perfectly valid image, uh, but it does lean heavily towards red. And arguably, if you stretch this out and apply color across red, green, and blue, you get a, a, a more aesthetically pleasing image, but you also I think gain some more scientific understanding of the processes, a particular region in space. This is the Eagle Nebula. There are bright young stars with strong stellar winds that are eroding the, the dense gas clouds here. And so when you apply the color this way, you can really get this sense of erosion of these, uh, the, the pillars are literally being eroded by the winds of the stars near them. And that, I, I feel like I get a, a, a more visceral interpretation of that process by seeing the image this way compared to the you know a, a color applied as to where it actually exists <clears throat> and again with the eagle nebula this is another image where i mean this happens with every image that we work on when you've made that first initial color composite that's not the end of the story there's a lot of work that goes into taking that and turning it into the in the final press image and that's where a lot of that you know the concepts of photography come into play I think of this almost as like landscape photography, shooting in raw mode. That it's a perfectly valid image. You've got you know a beautiful image of a landscape, and but in raw mode, you're you're losing some color saturation. There's you know highlights might be blown out, um, <clears throat> but you can recover all of that because in raw mode, you're capturing all the available data that the camera can give you. It's the same thing with Hubble. So we have that initial raw state of the image, and we can take it and you know touch it up and clean up the color balance. And eventually, we may do you know cropping or, or rotation and to to make it to the final image. I'm just stepping through those the process here. Uh, <clears throat> this image in particular shows some of the artifacts that we see around the edges of our chips because it's a a combination of of images. Around the edges, it's hard to get rid of the cosmic rays um, because they literally they litter every image that we take. They're always there, and so when you take multiple images, you can you know easily deal with them. But the edges are not sampled as well, and so there's you know tons of cosmic rays around the edges that eventually does get cropped out in the final version of the image. Now I want to. Shift gears again. Um, last week, Alistair talked to us about making mosaics. And I had a good example of a, a really interesting mosaic that was done with Hubble a few years ago of the Carina Nebula. And this is a, a star forming region uh, in the Milky Way. Uh, Hubble observed this. That's a, that's a single um, field of view for a Hubble observation in this region with the Advanced Camera for Surveys, ACS. 48 images of this region. And uh, we made a, a huge mosaic out of this. So here are those 48 individual exposures. And here you can see the gaps between the two chips. And you can also see <clears throat> there's a skew as the, um, the images are corrected for geometry. Uh, this all has to be put together somehow. And when you put it together, you get an image like this. Now, there's many different ways this can be done. Um, I didn't 
personally work on this image. Uh, my my predecessor, uh, Zolt LeVay, put this image together. And he um, he actually put the mosaic together by hand, sort of stitching it together piece by piece. Uh, I would probably try to do this with something like PixInsight now. Although there's not a lot of stars in it with the narrow band data, so that makes it hard. <laughs> uh, but Zolt did an amazing job on this image. Um, there's a few problems. There's chip gaps, obviously. Um, <clears throat> Eta Carina is that really bright spot on the left side. So that's another region that's, you know, saturated with some, there's some issues there. Together, you get a really beautiful image of this region. Now, this is just one filter. This was taken in, in, taken in hydrogen alpha. But we really wanted to try and put together a, a color image of this region. Time to take 48 observations of the region in all the different filters to get the color. Actually, combined with ground-based data, um, we used a nice little trick because uh, you can decompose an image from its color and its luminosity components. You can actually assemble an image from different data sets using that technique. So this was a uh, CTIO, uh, Sarah Tololo Observatory, a uh, four meter telescope, typical uh, hydrogen alpha, sulfur, oxygen, color composite. And we use that as the color information for the Hubble image and use the Hubble data as the luminosity layer. So looking in close, you can see that clearly um, adding color to the lower resolution CTIO image has pre preserved most of the resolution from Hubble, but allowed the color from the uh, CTIO image to show through. And of course, it's not perfect. It still requires some, some work. Uh, you can see those halos around the stars that need to be cleaned up. Um, but it really does produce a very nice result. As I mentioned before, this is the, um, the bright um, binary Eta Carina. That had to be dealt with as well. And we had other observations that were taken of Eta Carina by itself uh, that we could be that could be uh, worked into the image. Well, and I guess it, before I keep going on, I just want to make sure you guys can still hear me. Yeah, we can hear you, Joe. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Another example of an image that we um, just put together this year. This is NGC 2020. I had the privilege of working on this one for the 30th anniversary of Hubble's launch. Um, <clears throat> this was a 36 orbit four by three mosaic with WIF C3, and where we combined two broadband filters, uh, blue and red, with two narrowband filters in oxygen and uh, a slightly wider narrowband filter that covers hydrogen alpha and nitrogen two. We actually suffered some guide star problems while the data were being taken. And so what you're seeing on the right side here in this image is uh, this is a DSS ground-based image as the background and then showing three fields of view for all the different observations that were done to put this mosaic together. And a few of them are rotated because those are the ones that had to be re-observed due to uh, guide star problems. Um, <clears throat> that really was painful. <laughs> uh, we first observed it in January of this year. And then it took about six weeks to reobserve the regions where we had trouble. So um, the nominal roll angle had changed during that time, which is why those fields were then rotated. Harder to put the mosaic together. But so as the data were coming down, we started assembling the mosaic and knew we had you know another classic Hubble image on our hands. You know, one of the great privileges of my job is to be to be working on an image at my desk and seeing it come together in color and knowing you know this no one has ever seen this before uh, i'm the first person taking this data and turning it into a color image that you know it's going to it's going to be out there it's going to be another classic hubble image it's uh, such a privilege to be a part of that process here it is uh, this was our first working version of the color image after the first round of data were taken you can see our 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 missing data set, which was like literally right in the center of the image. That was so frustrating. <laughs> um, so this was an interesting combination here. I was just playing around with different ways of combining the data. And um, this one was not a good one. <laughs> the uh, I think it was applying the colors according to the spectrum. And that looks very green somehow. 
it's very strange. Uh, I think what what I ended up doing with this image was combining the broadband data first as a orange and cyan to get those star colors. Like that was the motivation behind the way we had uh, put together the observation was to get star colors through the broadband filters and then there to, to highlight the gas structure of the nebula. And this one in particular has this really interesting structure of uh, a wolf rayet star on the, the bottom left that ha it generates this, this nebula that shines really brightly in, um, in oxygen light. So in this image, it's blue. And then NGC 2014 is this sort of blob on the right side of this image. Uh, we ended up calling it the brain coral because of the, the bubbles here. By generations of star birth and the, the strong stellar winds caused by these stars, blowing literally blowing bubbles into a region of dense gas and dust and, and causing this you know, interesting shape and structure to, to come about. And then here's an example of, uh, you know, really stretching that image of NGC 2020. And, you know, this is one particular data set um, of the oxygen data, the F502 narrowband filter, uh, really highlighting the, the noise in the data that had to be dealt with. Um, and this, since this is one frame, we're seeing a lot of cosmic rays as well that hasn't, haven't been uh, accounted for yet in the processing. So there, there's so much work that goes into pulling all this together. Here is uh, an example of the broadband red filter, the narrowband hydrogen alpha, as it was colored in the final image, the oxygen, and then the broadband blue filter. And you can see in the broadbands, the stars really show through and the nebula really doesn't. Uh, the nebula is, it just shines through really nicely in the narrowband filters, of course. And then here's that, you know, combining the data that I just showed doing all of that color processing tonality and all the stuff we've been talking about to get to the final version here. And if you haven't had a chance to look at this image um, from the Space Telescope from Hubble site, uh, you know, from there you can get to the, the full high resolution image and you can you know, dive down into this really interesting feature here in, this, in the core. You know, there's the, the cluster stars at the top that are causing all of these structures to come about their winds are eroding again, like the pillars of creation. They're eroding the gas and dust and, and causing all these really interesting shapes. Um, you see this little bright cave on the left there. That's what we call that. <laughs> the bright cave. There's like another little tiny star cluster in there carving out a, a cave. Just incredible. These landscapes that are created through these processes of stars forming and dying and the winds of stars. It's just incredible. And so again, if you want to see all that stuff, go to Hubble site. Um, all of our latest press release information is there. All of our visualizations. There's a great visualization of NGC 2020. We, we're working with our animators and our 3D our artists to build a 3D model of NGC 2020. We actually, for the first time, did a, a combination of two different techniques that we've used in the past. One we like to call a uh, pseudo 3D. It's like a decoupage approach where you break down the image into different planes space. And so when you move a camera through that, it gives you a sense of depth. But in this particular release, we actually, we did that for NGC 2014. So you sort of fly in over NGC 2014, and then you come over this ridge and you're flying down and you get a completely different perspective on NGC 2020, which, you know, after consultation with our uh, scientists at Space Telescope who study these types of objects, 2020, despite its look, in the image, you know, looking, we called it the space calamari. <laughs> uh, it actually looks more like um, a tube that flares out on the ends. Uh, so we built a, a 3D model of that. And as you fly over 2014, you come down and you see NGC 2020 from the side, and it's like a completely different perspective on this object. And that's again available at, at Hubble site. Um, as I said earlier in the talk in the beginning, if you're interested in learning anything about the data, if you want to just get access to the data, there's the MAST archive available here, mast.stsei.edu. It's available to the public. Um, <clears throat> there's a usually a proprietary period of about one year for observations, and that just gives the scientists time to work with their data and uh, not get scooped <laughs> on their science results. 
year passes, the data become public and anybody can go to the master archive and enter the coordinates or the name of an object like M101, enter that in there and it'll do a search because it knows that M101 you know, is a, a galaxy and it knows its location. Um, and you can get, it's a little overwhelming because you'll get um, a huge list back of all the observations ever made of M101. And the, the master archive is actually an archive of more than just Hubble. Uh, so if you want to actually get results from Hubble, you have to do some filtering to get to that. Um, we've done some work to help people get access to images like NGC 2020. We have uh, what we call high-level science products. At the high-level science products page, you have access to highly processed versions of the images um, where we've gone through and cleaned everything up. We've created a very, very clean mosaic. We've gotten rid of all the cosmic rays that we could. Uh, and so you can get access to, you know, almost raw data that way, which is, I think it's a great entry to processing the data because you don't have to worry about all of that sort of pre-processing junk uh, that, that can be really difficult to work with. Um, you know, the way I would do that is we have software that was developed, again, it's freely available through a space telescope, but it's software that's developed specifically to process Hubble data and, and to go from the raw data to a sort of, you know, pre-processed a flat image to work with. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, last week, we were talking about mosaics with Alistair. Um, another great tool that's available through Space Telescope is access to the DSS, the Digitized Sky Survey. Do, uh, again, a name-based search or a coordinate search, and you can get access to you know almost the entire sky's worth of DSS data. Um, and I think you, yeah, you can go up to a maximum of 60 arc minutes per frame of DSS data. And that comes in, you know, red and blue and infrared. Um, so you can put together some really amazing images from ground-based data, um, through this tool. I actually used this for a press release when I was with Chandra, uh, that we were doing on the flame nebula. Um, this is straight from that tool DSS. I actually had to make four different frames here and, um, using PixInsight, I pulled together a mosaic to, to make the of the, the flame nebula that allows you to see uh, the horse head down at the bottom there. Uh, and finally, this is uh, a blog that I occasionally write on. I try to get guest bloggers as well. Um, we, uh, we look into talked about tonight, how, how these images are made. Uh, right now we've been focused on um, Hubble Heritage. That was a program that ended a few years ago and uh, its website was shut down, but we have been converting all of the old Hubble Heritage press releases into blog posts and posting them on illuminateduniverse.org. Blog posts here about the process of how images have been made, how we've done visualizations. Um, my, uh, <clears throat> my colleague, Zolt LeVay, has written many blog posts about, uh, one in particular that's come to mind is, are the colors real? You know, People always wanna know if these are real images is this really out there? Is this what it would look like if I could go out and see it with my eyes? Uh, so we've got you know plenty of posts to to help you answer those questions. That's all available here. And then finally, if you really want to, I'm putting my email address out there. This is my email address at Space Telescope. Um, if you want to get in touch directly with me, talk about space or anything, feel free to do so. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks, thanks, Joe. That was fascinating. Um... We're all kind of jealous of all the data that you have to work with, but I imagine it's also a tremendous amount of effort in order to process that. Uh, how generally do you take out the flaws in the data? I mean, is there a particular, is there a piece of software or do you just patch them up in Photoshop or what's your general process? Yeah, so again, it's like, um, wait, I should stop sharing, right? Because then you can see my face. Okay. Um, that process, again, like I was going to say, I, I see all these different uh, software packages as tools that we can use. And so depending on what problem I'm working with, I'll, I'll try and find a tool that will address that problem. Um, for cosmic rays, I do use Photoshop for some of that if we haven't been able to get rid of them all in the software. Um, you know, there are some techniques where you can stack an image on top of the other one, applying a mask to it, do like a, a median blur filter on it, use 
a mask to, to bring the cosmic rays out that way. Um, I, I, I use that. that. When all else fails, there's a clone, <laughs> a clone stamp. I never clone stars. I never clone objects. I only ever clone the noise in the data. Um, I don't ever want to introduce something that's not in the data. So if I'm using Zort, but it's there uh, as a tool again, but used very sparingly. When you're processed, do you use your desktop computer or do you have access to some things in the cloud? I mean, some of these files have to be ungodly large. <laughs> I choke out a desktop pretty easily. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the largest I worked on recently was NGC 2020, and that Photoshop file ended up being about 20 gigabytes. It slow things down on my computer quite a bit. <laughs> But I actually do work mostly on a desktop computer. I have a Mac Pro at work that um, handles most of the imagery that I work on very well. Uh, are there any flaws in the sensors in Hubble now after all these years? The, uh, the sensors have held up remarkably well. With C3 and ACS, um, you know, it's been 11 years for them. One thing we have with WIF C3, and it's always been there, is in the IR channel, there's something we call the Death Star. And that's just a, a little patch of bad pixels that's at like the bottom corner of one of the CCDs. And that was just a manufacturing flaw that's been there since the beginning. Um, other things that have come up while they've been in orbit are you know things like bad columns, bad pixels. Uh, most of that stuff can be calibrated out or it can be handled by dithering and in observations or taking multiple frames and combining them together and then, you know, to get rid of those artifacts. So really it's it's kind of remarkable how well these these instruments are holding up. Joe, I, I, second Eric. Well, we're uh, on the topic. Go ahead. Um, I once read that all of the pixels, each individual pixel on each camera is actually characterized so that you know how it relates in output to every other pixel and everything else like that. Is that true? Is that approximate? Is that baloney? <laughs> I would say, um, I mean, I don't know specifically because I, I have never worked directly with the calibration of of Hubble. But based on my experience doing calibration work with Chandra, uh, we did understand a very long time understanding the CCD response uh, the, the quantum efficiency of the CCD, uh, any kinds of uh, charge transfer inefficiencies, we calibrated all that stuff out and we were always working on it It was because it's constantly changing. And I know it's the same process with Hubble. Uh, um, do you use darks yeah. and, and flat fields and things like that? Yeah, and again, that's all done um, before I even see the data. That, that, that step of processing has been handled already. So when you go into the mass archive and pull data out, you're already getting, you know, flat, flat and bias and dark corrected data. What do you think about the possible end of Hubble? Uh, I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Hubble, I, it's got several more years, definitely. The, the, the one limiting factor is the gyroscopes. Uh, if the gyroscopes go bad, then we can't point it accurately anymore, and that would be awful. But in, in terms of consumables, Hubble could go on for decades. Several questions about how uh, the uh, Hubble is pointed, and it sounds like it's also guided from your presentation. Can you explain just a touch about how that happens? Yes. Yeah, so there, the gyroscopes are really integral to pointing the telescope. They're what allow it to to, to rotate and move. Um, you just you know change the rotational speed of the gyros, and it's all very well calibrated. And uh, you move Hubble to generally the area that it's going to observe. And then <clears throat> there's the fine guidance sensor that looks at a, a specific patch of sky and it knows what stars it expects to see. And it will line up uh, according to those stars. And then once that happens, the gyroscopes go into a sort of more sensitive mode that allows the telescope to maintain its pointing really accurately. Okay. Now, when, uh, the, when Webb goes up there, are you going to possibly be working on the images from Webb? Yes, I will be. Uh, that was one of the reasons why I was hired. <laughs> um, you know, it's been delayed a, a bit, but when I was hired at Space Telescope, Webb was to have launched by now. It was supposed to have launched in October of 2018. Uh, now it's going to launch in October of 2021. 
And of course, there'll be no uh, going up and repairing web. It's out on L1 and it's either there or, or it's not. Yeah, it's a little scary, but it's, uh, you know, we've been, it's working on it for a long time. Our engineers have, have taken care of every possible scenario. And so we, we understand that system very, very well. It's uh, expected to work and, and provide amazing results. Have you ever been down to physically see some of the this telescopes before launch? No, I haven't had the opportunity to do that. I, I just missed it when I started at Space Telescope. I think maybe six months before I started, they had it, um, the mirrors were on display at the Goddard Space Flight Center. I think. I think that's what it was. And uh, a number of staff from Space Telescope had a chance to go down and see them. But I wasn't, uh, I wasn't actually working there at that time. The uh, the sensors are CCDs or CMOS. Um, on Hubble or, or Web. On Hubble. Yeah, on Hubble, I I believe they're CCDs. Um, I don't have that information on me right now, but yeah. Yeah, someone says, oh, uh, I would have to agree with this statement. Oh my God, best job ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I feel very fortunate to have this job. I have to say, we need we need to get into some of the questions that the uh, audience is uh, uh, asking. Uh, uh, Joe, I was wondering how how do you deal with those missing slivers of data that I saw in your mosaics? Yeah, those little tiny thin guys that are just dark. Yeah, so sometimes we'll go in and fill those in with ground-based data where we can. And of course, it's going to be much lower resolution. Um, but at it, like I've done that before, and I'll know that I'm getting real data. Um, you know, if there's a star in there, I know that that's really a star, and I'm not just like adding something into the image by cloning out that region. It's a little clunky, but um, usually it works. Those those gaps are usually very small. I mean, once you've got the full mosaic put together cleanly, it's almost not. You, know, you really have to be a pixel peeper to find them. <laughs> um, Chandrasekhar Nori asks, uh, "What's the construction of the Hubble scope? It's a RC design, which you create in." Uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand that question. What what is the design? Is it a, um, a Richie Gretchen design or a straight uh, uh, design? Yeah. Do you know? I actually don't know. I mean, oh, okay. I should know that, right? <laughs> so you're the image processor. Yeah, yeah. And then we've got several people talking about the issue you just talked about as far as the um, uh, uh, not being able to service the web telescope because it's going to be way out there. Um, all of the cameras you're talking about are monochrome, John wants to ask, right? Yes. They're, yeah, they're, you're just getting grayscale images. Right. Um, answer Jay Polanco's question about the, what software you use. You use whatever you can get your hands on. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And you said there were 48 different filters. Uh, George, who is it, Glenn? Glenn is asking about what kind of filters does it have? Can you give us a general description of that? And maybe not going through each and every one? Sure, yeah. So the, the 48 different filters, that covers everything from um, ultraviolet to near infrared, on specifically on the WIF-C3 uh, UVIS detector, uh, UVIS IR detector. And there's wide band filters that cover, you know, large areas of the spectrum, and then there's medium bands and then narrow bands. And, you know, I could go and name all of them, but... What would you consider a narrow in a narrow band? What would you consider narrow? Yeah, three well, nanometer or five man nanometer. Do you get into that? Yeah, right. I, I don't have the plots in front of me, so I don't know exactly what they are. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's see. There's a if there Ray's asked a photography. Ray, you're in the room, aren't you? Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Or if you aren't in the room, if there's a 30 magnitude object, it takes seven days for Hubble to take its picture. It's what he read. Can you explain what that means? Well, so Hubble has to integrate light over uh, an exposure time. Um, its orbit is uh, 90 minutes, and so it can't look continuously at one object forever. It, it, uh, Earth eventually gets in the way, depending on you know where you're looking in the sky. Um, so it takes time to build up the signal for an observation. 
Uh, so, I mean, hopefully that answers that question. <laughs> okay. It just takes a long yeah. time to build up that much, to gather that much light, even though you're out in space and everything else. Yeah. Okay. So when you're, when you're mapping uh, color to an image, I mean, you could have three, four, five, ten different filters, all of which you'll have to decide how to map to that RGB image. That's right. Yeah. I mean, that that one, uh, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field that I showed you had 13 filters in it. And sometimes I'll use a technique uh, in PixInsight where you define a color space and then you assign uh, the colors across the filter range that you have. And so you build basically a custom RGB space where the filters fill it out. Um, There's a lot of combinations possible combinations when you have that many filters there are yeah. certain rules that you follow like stars can't be green or <laughs> yeah people really hate to see green things in space so we try to avoid green <laughs> but uh you know generally speaking i think i my first approach is always to go chromatically chromatically order uh the data so starting with the longest wavelengths in red moving through green and blue to shorter wavelengths. So if I have 13 filters, I'm going to start with, you know, the, the near infrared and assign that to red and then move my way to shorter wavelengths, getting bluer and bluer. Frodo asks, Frodo asks, um, have there been any uh, impacts from space debris on the Hubble Space Telescope? And how do you detect and correct for them? Now, before you go too far down that road, later on in the question stack here, there's a series of questions about the um, mega constellations of communication satellites that have been launched recently. Do they cause you any problems? So in terms of like micrometeorite impacts, I'm not aware of any ever actually striking Hubble it does happen. It has happened to, for example, uh, XMM was the European X-ray telescope, um, sort of the European version of Chandra. They suffered some micrometeorite hits that actually struck the detector of XMM and like knocked out an entire CCD. Uh, so it does happen. Hubble has been very fortunate, you know, knock on wood, um, in 30 years, I don't think there's ever been. Okay, I'm reading through the questions here. Where are we? Uh, a series run right through the image and that. Oh. That can be a communication satellite that happened to cross the path of that observation. But in general, you know, Hubble's field of view is so small that the chances of having something cross your field of view while you're observing are very small. Okay. Um, Arrow points out here, you know, most of the things that Joe does with his $3 billion scope are the same things we do with our $3,000 rigs. <laughs> in your dreams. <laughs> <laughs> and Joe, I have a question. Who runs who runs them who runs the Hubble mechanically? Like when you have an option, let's say you even want to do like a pretty picture, like you do, and you wanted to create that mosaic bit to somewhere, but what department actually runs the instrument? So that's run through NASA. There's uh there's a proposal program where you can write a proposal to observe with Hubble goes through a, a review process. There's a peer review process. And actually, Space Telescope is one of the first institutes to run a double-blind peer review. So the people reviewing don't know who submitted. And of course, the people who submitted don't know who's reviewing. Uh, so it makes for a very fair, equitable um, allocation of telescope time. Uh, so you can't, so yeah. call your, you can't call your buddy and say, hey, <laughs> do me a favor? <laughs> yeah, not usually, no. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have a question. Are there any other people like you processing these images yes. uh, right now? Yeah, we, uh, I have a colleague who we hired just last year, um, Elisa Pagan. Um, she has an APOD from, I think, August. She's, she's, uh, she's doing amazing work. Uh, she's come on to, to help because it was just me for a while after Zolt retired and it's kind of a lot of work. <laughs> And when, when web launches, it's going to be even more work. So we definitely needed another person to help. 
do you submit your images to uh, the APOD to uh, Jerry and Robert? Uh, we don't submit them. No, they do end up there occasionally. Um, I don't know how. <laughs> I don't submit them. I, I feel like it's kind of unfair for Hubble images to go up on APOD. If they want to put them up, that's fine with me. <laughs> I never get credit anyway, so it doesn't matter. Alex, you got any more questions? Uh, I was just reviewing. I think we've got uh, everything in here. Uh, uh, there's some other talk along the way and just kind of admiring you and, and, and the work that you do and stuff like that. So, yeah. Um, I wanted to uh, thank you for being here tonight. It, it certainly did add a lot uh, to know that you're just a regular human being doing a lot of the same kinds of things I'm trying to do, probably with a whole lot more skill, definitely with a better data set than I have. Um, but you're using whatever software you can to bring out pictures as, as well as you can and those kinds of things. It, it's pretty impressive to know that there's that all that beautiful work is done by a group of regular human beings. Yeah. You know, you just, you know. And thanks, Eric, okay. for reaching out to me. Okay. Um, could you, oh, I did, we did miss a question. What's the F stop? It was F24 and 58,000 millimeter focal length. Yeah. <laughs> Yikes. I think we kind okay. of love the idea, uh, and that's what Aura was, was talking about. We, lo we love the idea that you're using the same software to process Hubble images as we are to process images on our little dinky scopes. And that just <laughs> feels really cool. <laughs> you know, I, I want to make a comment. There is a recurring question that comes up once every five to 10 days on uh, cloudy nights, which is our... Um, you know, chat where we all go and socialize and stuff like that. And it says, it's asked in various ways. One form, um, I've got a, um, you know, I took some pictures last night and I want to take some pictures tonight with a, uh, with a different setup. Can I merge that data? Or uh, is there any place that I can get, you know, this telescope and that telescope data and merge them together? And um, I, from what I've gathered, you guys do that all the time. Oh, yeah. You know what? You guys take data from all over the place and put them into the same picture. I actually have some slides, if, I, if you have a few minutes, I, that I... Go for I it. Hit. Okay. Go so for it. Yeah. yeah, they're still awake. Yeah. Okay. Let me just jump back in real quick here. Yeah. Uh, uh, where is that? Here we go. Meanwhile, if anybody else has any questions, get them in because after Joe finishes telling us a little bit about, you know, putting together patchwork from other telescopes, we'll do, um, uh, we're going to be closing off. Okay. So get any questions you have in. Uh, so While he's getting ready, remember uh, uh, to go out and plant a picture, a spectacular picture of something in Orion. Don't use Hubble to data though. Okay. Don't use Hubble <laughs> data. That's cheating. Okay, it's got to be your own data taken with your own telescope or your buddy's telescope if you, if you don't know you're borrowing it. Anyway, go for it, Joe. Okay, so I'm just showing here real quick. Uh, this is an image of M106 that I did a few years ago when I was with Chandra. And a lot of the work that I did with Chandra involved combining data from Hubble with Chandra uh, because it just really helps to have the, the angular resolution and the detail and the familiarity with you know the objects um, if you look at just an X-ray image, sometimes it's just so foreign that it's hard to understand what it is. Um, but in this case, this is actually a great observatories composite that combines Hubble and Chandra and the Spitzer infrared telescope, and then also radio uh, ground-based radio data. And so the way this was done, um, here are the, the the images in color as they were combined. I took what, what's the wavelength of Chandra? Is it X-ray? Yes, it's X-ray. Okay. Yeah. So, so starting with um, this Hubble image of M106, which uh, uh, was released, I forget exactly when, maybe 2014 or so, um, I took this image into PixInsight and I actually decomposed its colors um, because I wanted to free up some color space to work with uh, the other wavelengths, the infrared, x-ray, and, and radio. 
to its RGB color channels and then recombined it uh, with just the uh, green and blue channels. And you can see here, like, that's actually my pixel math combination there. Um, now, one of the real challenges of combining data from all these different observatories is the different uh, plate scales. You know, Hubble being by far the most high resolution in all of these cases. Um, in this example image here, I've got, uh, I think this was like a one arc second box or something. I forget exactly what the measurement was, but it's the same size in each one of the images. So they all have to be scaled to match the same plate scale. Um, usually with data like X-ray, infrared, and radio, there's a lot of amorphous features that can be blown up as much as you want, basically. And so I usually scale them up to match Hubble. Um, so that was done in PixInsight. And then um, I was actually, in this case, experimenting with doing the full color combination in PixInsight. And so what I have up here is an equation that describes the process of doing a screen combination. Um, if you were to, you know, in Photoshop, have a layer that you want to screen on top of the other layer, this is the equation that Photoshop's doing under the hood to make that happen. So I wrote a pixel math equation to basically do screen for, you know, RGB combination in pixel math for each of the different um, filters here. So uh, O is the Hubble optical image, X is the Chandra X-ray image, I is the infrared image, and R is the radio image. And then that's sort of the the color combinations there. Um, you know, the, the RGB values that you would apply to make one image blue and one image red and one in purple. Um, so yeah, again, it's like screen. You bring in the X-ray, bring in uh, infrared, or I'm sorry, the first one was radio, and then this is X-ray. Yep. So you could take anything from anything and, and with a lot of work somehow or another match the pixel scale and go for it. That's right. Yeah. Getting the pixel scales matched is like the most important part. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, on the amateur side of the house, uh, if you're working with telescopes that aren't as vastly different in pixel scale as like the Hubble and Chandra and whatnot, um, uh, the registration algorithm in PixInsight can handle those those uh, relatively smaller changes in scale from your refractor to your reflector. Uh, you don't have to go through and do a whole lot of the complicated bits. Um, uh, reg the registration algorithm can handle that, Starline. Yeah, yeah, PixInsight's tools for that are really fantastic. OK, I think we've gotten through all the questions, right, Eric? Have you seen anything else that we've missed? Um, no, I don't see anything. Today. I think we've covered it pretty well. Okay. Excellent. Great. No, thanks so much. I'm just uh, fascinated. Yeah. Now, remember, we need other presenters. If anybody would like to make a presentation, please get a hold of us. It, the, the most difficult job of putting on the Astro Imaging Channel is finding presenters on a regular basis. And it would really be nice if you guys would, um, you know, you've done some stuff. And I think everybody can talk a little bit, make a little PowerPoint about what they're doing. Ray's astrophotography next week is one of such volunteer. And we hope that we can find others of you out there to volunteer. Uh, there's one of us happening every Sunday night, maybe except for Christmas, New Year's, and Super Bowl Sunday, of course. Um, so please contribute. Molly? I'm turning it back over to you and Control, and we'll talk about the audio at the beginning a little later. <laughs> no. <laughs> I didn't. Yeah, okay, I messed it up. All right, have a good night, everybody. <laughs> Take us out. Joe, you can hang out with us. <laughs>